She was charming, sweet, and she was just a wonderful actress. You try to punish me or thank me, Pops. She was so graceful and such an intelligent woman and so strong. Well, I'm a person, and I was violated, and I'm not guilty. She was the daughter of a famous movie star, and a woman determined to carve out her own identity. As the veteran of more than 200 roles on stage, movies, and television, Elizabeth Montgomery proved herself as more than just a pretty face. But it was as a nose-twitching witch that she would find her largest audience and her greatest acclaim. I am a witch. She was sly and clever and witty. She was just absolutely delightful. It was the height of the Great Depression, but in Hollywood, California, it was the golden age of cinema, where movie stars and studio moguls lived like royalty. It was here, on April 15, 1933, that popular leading man Robert Montgomery and his wife Elizabeth proudly announced the birth of a daughter whom they named Elizabeth Victoria. Elizabeth's father, Robert Montgomery, had been a great star in the glory days of Louis B. Mayer, and he was a very handsome man, a wonderful actor, both as a sophisticated uh, comedian and also uh, in great dramatic roles. Though the MGM contract player worked six days a week, on Sundays he relished his role as father. Elizabeth's mother was a stage actress who had given up her career when she married. And although the family's every need was tended to by a staff of household help, Mrs. Montgomery devoted herself to Elizabeth and to her younger brother, Robert Jr. And the family's elegant Bel Air home was an ideal site for the extravagant birthday parties little Elizabeth enjoyed each year. Formal events often presided over by her father himself. He was a very classic, traditional man who had um, very strong values, and he was very politically minded. And he was the kind of guy who'd, who'd call even his friends by, by the last name, Mr. So-and-so. This kind of world that she lived in did not contribute to normal childhood. Uh, she was expected to be dressed properly and to have good manners and behave in a certain way. And I think she took that as an act because it didn't reflect a lot of her own deep feelings. So, in a sense, she was always an actress. In 1939, Elizabeth was enrolled at the prestigious Westlake School for Girls in Los Angeles. It was there that the headstrong six-year-old first appeared on stage, playing the wolf in a French-language production of Little Red Riding Hood to a delighted audience. That same year, Elizabeth's parents left for London, where her father was to make a film. Elizabeth and her brother were left in the care of their grandmother, Rebecca, who brought a sense of adventure to her granddaughter's conservative upbringing. Her grandmother was the one who introduced her to horse racing. When she was a little girl, her grandmother came into her room and said, no, you're not going to school, you're going to the track with me. You'll learn much more about math at the track than you'll ever learn in that class. She loved her. But Elizabeth's carefree childhood would soon come to an end. On December 7th, 1941, Japanese planes attacked Pearl Harbor, forcing the United States to declare war. Robert Montgomery immediately enlisted in the Navy, where he joined other leading men in the military like Jimmy Stewart and Clark Gable. Over the next four years, as Elizabeth matured into an athletic and independent adolescent, she feared constantly for her father's safety, only seeing him during infrequent leaves. In 1945, World War II ended, and Lieutenant Commander Robert Montgomery came home a hero. 
Elizabeth was overjoyed to have her adored father back at last. But when the 40-year-old movie star returned to work, he found that the prime roles were going to younger actors. And after five frustrating years, he informed his surprised family that they were leaving Hollywood for a fresh start in New York City. For 17-year-old Elizabeth, the move to Manhattan was thrilling. She reveled in the freedom of New York City, and with her beauty, her infectious sense of humor, and her status as the daughter of a Hollywood star, she quickly became the center of attention in a sophisticated crowd of creative young people. She was so graceful and such an intelligent woman and so strong and was usually the life of the party, the life of the table. The move to New York also proved successful for her father, who focused his considerable talent and energy on the burgeoning television industry. Almost overnight, he became one of the medium's top empresarios, producing, directing, and sometimes acting in a weekly show named Robert Montgomery Presents. Thank you, Tom, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to the Johnson's Wax Program. But just as Elizabeth had begun to settle into what seemed an idyllic life, her father shocked everyone when he fell in love with oil heiress Buffy Harkness. In 1950, Elizabeth's parents were divorced. And just days later, Robert remarried. The divorce devastated her. She had worshipped her father. And uh, as happens, I think, in many cases, she was thoroughly devastated by it. But she put on a front. She put on a face to, to cover her disappointment and disillusionment. Thrown off balance by her father's behavior, the teenager was ill-prepared for the media's scrutiny of her family's travails. Angry and humiliated, Elizabeth grew wary of the press. The young woman gradually came to terms with her father's failings, and despite her fears of life in the public eye, she announced her intention to become an actress. But Robert Montgomery was less than encouraging. My mom wanted to follow, not really follow in her father's footsteps, but she knew that that's what she wanted to do. She wanted to entertain. I remember her saying that her father warned her about this business being very difficult on your self-esteem. You're, you're selling yourself, and it's very difficult on people's egos and self-esteem to be rejected, and it's a difficult business. Immediately after her high school graduation, Elizabeth enrolled at the prestigious American Academy of Dramatic Arts, whose recent graduates included such rising stars as Grace Kelly and Ann Bancroft. The aspiring actress worked diligently to learn her craft, and in 1951, she auditioned and won a role as a guest star on her father's show. I find a cigarette indispensable for quieting one's nerves, or when one's nerves aren't quiet. Uh, don't you, Emily? Cornelia. Cork tipped. Uh, so I'll see, Miss. Max, please. <coughs> As you said, Miss Cork tipped. <coughs> you lit the wrong end. Uh, I, I know. I prefer it that way. Elizabeth was the star of a particular episode, and I was the stage manager. And we became friends. You knew from the beginning that she was going to make it, even though she had all the privileges of uh, having a father with a show who could put her on and introduce her to people. She had a real talent, always. And she had a real drive to succeed. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Miss Elizabeth Montgomery and Miss Sally Hello. Kemp. Uh, I want to tell them both, and I'm sure that you will join with me, how very, very much we enjoyed their performances. We're, well, pr we're proud of both of them. Well, thank you very much. Robert Montgomery was so impressed with his daughter's performance that she was soon a part of the regular ensemble cast. She and her father were so close, they adored each other. I think he loved 
having her as an actress and, uh, and having her be so good. I mean, she was a thoroughbred, Elizabeth. But for 19-year-old Elizabeth, success was bittersweet. She had proved she could act, but would she ever be known as anything more than her father's daughter? Over the next three years, Elizabeth Montgomery worked hard to establish herself as an actress, appearing on Broadway in such plays as Late Love and honing her skills in television programs like Craft Theater and Studio One, where she played an ambitious young fashion editor in an episode entitled The Drop of a Hat. Incidentally, I registered at Trap Hagen two nights a week. Well, at that rate, you just might bag a diploma before rigor mortis sets in. Don't you believe in formal training? I believe in putting talent to work, not sending it back to school. Yes, of course. New York critics took notice, and in 1954, Elizabeth was honored to receive the Theater World Award as one of the most promising personalities of the year, along with such emerging stars as James Dean and Eva Marie Saint. But the young actress was still struggling to develop her own identity. A lot of the times when she would be out, people would meet her or meet her with her father. It was She was Robert Montgomery's daughter. And boy, did she want to get past that. My mom was somebody who felt very strongly about who she was. But at 21 years of age, Elizabeth was preoccupied with more than just her professional life. The actress had fallen in love with a Harvard-educated stage manager whom she had met while guest starring on her father's show. After a brief but romantic courtship, on March 27, 1954, Elizabeth married Frederick Cammon in a grand society wedding and the couple settled into a modest apartment on the Upper East Side. We lived in the same building. My wife and I and, and Elizabeth and Freddie were at the, a, a floor above us. She was a darling, darling girl. I mean, she was truly funny, and she loved to have fun. I've had some of the best laughs of my life with her. But Hollywood was beckoning. Elizabeth had begun to attract the attention of movie producers who urged her to move west. When Freddie refused to follow her to Los Angeles, Elizabeth was forced to choose between her marriage and her career. After a little more than a year, the two were amicably divorced. In 1955, the 22-year-old Elizabeth Montgomery made her film debut in the military drama The Court Martial of Billy Mitchell, starring Gary Cooper and Rod Steiger. Don't blame Zach for what you did. Zack wouldn't have called his superior officers traitors. He didn't disobey orders. I can't do anything to help you, Billy. Although Elizabeth's reviews were excellent, the film made very little impression at the box office. But the young actress had made a dramatic impression on the charismatic Hollywood star, Gig Young. The couple began dating, and before long, the smitten Elizabeth resolved to make him her next husband. 20 years her senior, Gig Young had made a name for himself playing debonair cads in crowd-pleasing comedies. And just as Elizabeth had predicted, on December 28, 1956, the two were married. Robert Montgomery did not attend the wedding, signaling a growing rift in the close relationship between Elizabeth and her famous father. Bob Montgomery was not pleased with that relationship. He didn't like Gig Young. In a curious way, Gig Young was a younger version of Bob Montgomery. He could play that same kind of role, sophisticated, glamorous. But she and Gig were very, very happy. Head over heels in love, Elizabeth put her own career on hold to follow her husband as he divided his time between Broadway and Hollywood. But behind Gig Young's charm and good looks lay the demons of an abusive alcoholic. Though the couple's fiery arguments frequently left Elizabeth depressed and terrified, she could not bring herself to confide in even her closest friends. She kept things to herself very much. No dwelling. She was secretive and she didn't really like people to know if she was upset or worried or in pain or in anguish of any kind, you know. She toughed things out. Trapped in a troubled marriage, Elizabeth returned to acting. For the next four years, she worked constantly, 
guest starring on numerous hit television shows, including The Twilight Zone and The Untouchables, in which she played a southern prostitute. Starring Robert Stack as Elliot Ness. Co-starring Elizabeth Montgomery. Tonight's episode, The Rusty Heller Story. Well, it's got no sense. Can't tell a hood from a cop. Even an untouchable ain't puncture-proof, honey. I appreciate the concern. You're just a super boy scout, ain't you? Do you want to die, is that it? I'm trying to understand you. Is busting into speakeasies and breaking up little old crap games really worth risking your life over? I'll bet your wife don't think so. The 27-year-old actress earned critical praise for her gutsy performance, and to her great surprise, she was nominated for an Emmy Award. After 10 years in the business, her career was soaring, and for the first time, she felt she was making her own mark in Hollywood. When she finally broke into her career, I remember her telling me she got a kick out of the time when she and her father were together, and it switched. It was like, oh, you're Elizabeth Montgomery's father. Yes, she said. <laughs> But even growing success could not take away the heartbreak of Elizabeth's crumbling marriage to Gig Young. It was not a pleasant experience for her that there was some domestic violence involved and that she had to get out of it. And luckily, she, she was smart enough and strong-willed enough to do it. In the spring of 1963, Elizabeth went to Mexico to quietly end her six-year marriage. But the 30-year-old actress would not remain single for long. She was about to meet a man who would change the course of her life and her career. I met Elizabeth when we uh, were casting Johnny Cool, and she was one among many that we saw. And when I saw her, I was uh, nuts about her. I thought she was great. And that was the end of the casting call. William Asher was a well-known director of feature films and such classic television fare as I Love Lucy, Our Miss Brooks, and Make Room for Daddy. When he offered Elizabeth the lead role in the action-packed gangster picture Johnny Cool, she was excited to have another chance to make her mark in movies. What do you know about Johnny Cool? Oh, I know a great deal about Johnny Cool. Maybe more than anyone. I know he's a killer. I've seen him kill. But I don't know who turned him into a murder machine and why he kills. Yet I love him. Even though I know very well that it's just as easy for him to kill me as it is to kiss me. Johnny, I need you. I need you right now. But there was more happening on the set than just filming. Once again, Elizabeth found herself in a behind-the-scenes romance, this time with her 43-year-old director. They were great together, and they had very much in common, both extremely intelligent people with great sense, senses of humor. Later that same year, Elizabeth was cast in the light comedy Who's Been Sleeping in My Bed? It's Dean Martin as the celebrated TV doctor with such a bedside manner that his private pad becomes a built-in magnet for every lovely, sleepless female in the world. This one's a sculptress who turns any man into instant putty. She turned in a spirited performance as a seductive artist determined to get her reluctant fiancé to the altar. And to the altar was just where Elizabeth Montgomery was headed for the third time. We uh, eloped. We just took off, got married in El Paso. I mean, I was uh, crazy about her. I mean, it was just, I was in love with her. Happy in their new life, Elizabeth and William hoped they could find a project they could work on together. In the summer of 1963, Asher came across a script for a TV series called The Witch of Westport, based on the intriguing premise of an unusual mixed marriage. As Asher began developing the idea, Elizabeth helped him to fashion the lead character. 
The exhilaration of conceiving the series together was heightened when Elizabeth learned that she was pregnant. And on July 24, 1964, the couple welcomed their first child, a son named William Allen. And just two months later, on September 17th, ABC broadcast the pilot episode of the Asher's new program. The title was Bewitched. Once upon a time, there was a typical American girl who happened to bump into a typical red-blooded American boy. They had a typical wedding, went on a typical honeymoon. It so happens that this girl is a witch. The show featured Elizabeth as a suburban sorceress named Samantha. Co-starring were Agnes Moorhead as Andorra, Samantha's meddling mother, and Dick York as Darren Stevens, her unsuspecting mortal husband. I wish I had a drink. <laughs> that old fashioned. <laughs> and a straw. <laughs> You're a witch. <laughs> That's what I've been trying to tell you. The program was an instant success. Audiences were entranced by the show's unique blend of humor and magic. But most of all, they loved Elizabeth. Darren, I suppose I shouldn't have married you, but I love you so much. I love you too, but I hadn't figured on this. I'll make you a good wife, I promise. With a hit TV series, a happy marriage, and a growing family, Elizabeth Montgomery had finally emerged from the shadow of her celebrated father, and it seemed that she was casting a spell over just about everyone. 1964, the all-American families portrayed in such programs as Father Knows Best and Leave it to Beaver were disappearing from the television landscape. In their place, fantasy shows like The Addams Family and The Munsters offered audiences a twist on tradition. Just a minute. Bewitched brought its own spin to the typical TV household. With Samantha's brains, beauty, and supernatural power, it was clear that it was she and not her husband, Darren, who was in control. Bewitched became the nation's number two show by the end of its first season, and the twitch of Samantha's nose, <laughs> signifying that a spell had been cast, became her trademark. That was an accident. It was just a twitch. My mom and father were talking, and she twitched her nose. And my father said, what was that that you just did with your nose? She said, what are you talking about? I, she had no idea she'd even done it. That was it. That's how we're going to make the magic happen. As the hit program entered its second year, Elizabeth was overjoyed to discover that she was expecting another child. But rather than hide her pregnancy from the camera, she and William Asher decided it would be fun to work it into the show. In the fall of 1965, the couple welcomed their second son, Robert. And on TV, Samantha gave birth to a daughter, Tabitha. Already known as one of television's most creative series, the third season of Bewitched brought two major changes. This year, Bewitched and Samantha and her beguiling babe are up to hilarious new tricks. No, cut that up! Bewitched in color on ABC. The show was now filmed in color, and two-year-old twins, Aaron and Diane Murphy, were cast to play Samantha and Darren's magical daughter. <laughs> No, sweetheart. Mommy doesn't want you to do that, remember? Elizabeth was very much like a mother to me. We spent so much time together on the set as well as off the set, where I would go to her house and play with her kids on the weekend, and we'd go trick-or-treating together and go see movies together. It was honestly like having another parent. It was a great relationship. The ensemble cast of Bewitched also included veteran actors David White, Paul Lind, and Sandra Gould as Samantha's high-strung neighbor, Gladys Kravitz. Uh, Mrs. Stevens, uh, I, I just wondered, what happened to your car? Now, I have a question for you two. What happened to your shoes? 
One cup of sugar coming up. The minute you think you're funny as a comedian, you're not funny. You know, if you look, say, look at me, I'm being funny. Forget it. She never thought she was funny. And everything came out of honesty. And every great comedian that you'll ever watch, it comes out of honesty. I think Liz was an amazing comedian. She was one of those people who was an absolutely incredibly beautiful woman, but she wasn't afraid to look silly. When Bewitched threatened to become formulaic, Elizabeth and William created an alter ego for Samantha, a mischievous and seductive cousin named Serena. The new role gave Elizabeth an opportunity to stretch her skills as a comedic actress. Serena! Has dear cousin Samantha gone? She's just left. Now it's time to get to work. I'll bet it'll be more fun than the time I joined the Navy. <laughs> just a few small details. She needed that character to change her mood a little bit and give her a little breathing room. And I remember her telling me she liked that role, that character she liked a lot. That was a lot of fun for her. What are you doing in that outfit? I'm going out to do some shopping. You are not. Why not? People will stare. You'll attract attention. So what? Other men don't think I'm so bad to look at. I'm sick of simmering like a watched pot. I want to get out and boil. Serena was a little loose. <laughs> and she was so good at that role that a lot of fans thought it was a different actress. Uh, uh, Samantha, darling, it was all your mother's idea. <laughs> Although she quickly perfected her portrayal of the two divergent characters, off-screen, Elizabeth struggled to balance her dual roles as actress and mother. And she often found it difficult to spend as much time as she'd like with her children, William, Robert, and her daughter, Rebecca, who was born in 1969. For us, it was just hard not having her around so much, working so much, but the time that she did make for us was such quality time. I mean, she would always come in and kiss us goodnight and tuck us in no matter how late it was. And on the weekends and time that she would be at home uh, was really nice time together. She just had this kind of magical persona and it was almost childlike. And she loved surprises and she loved art and she loved being creative at Christmas and she loved all that. She loved to, to really come up with new things. Elizabeth also expressed her creativity on the set. Between takes, she could be found drawing in one of her many sketchbooks or perusing the racing form. After five seasons, Bewitched was still riding high in the ratings as one of television's best loved comedies. Action. Camera. Lights. Extras. Elizabeth Montgomery had gone from hard-working TV actress to one of television's most recognizable stars. But when lead actor Dick York began complaining of severe back pain, his co-workers became alarmed. His suffering became so intense that one day he had to be rushed off the set on a stretcher. It was clear that he could no longer continue working, and with York's departure, the fate of the series was uncertain. But a major cast change would not be the only upheaval in Elizabeth's life. Darren Stevens, he's got the spirit. She's the spirit. Mother! Bewitched began its sixth season with a new Darren to play opposite Samantha. Producers cast Dick Sargent in the role, and he and Elizabeth quickly became close friends. With Elizabeth Montgomery. Ready. Every week. Ready. On ABC. But by the early 1970s, audiences were beginning to crave more cutting-edge fare. And when ABC ran the show against the groundbreaking sitcom All in the Family, Bewitched took a dive in the ratings. And after eight years, 
254 episodes and five Emmy nominations for Best Actress, Elizabeth Montgomery announced that she was ready for a change. The show itself was not as strong as it had been, and uh, that bothered her. And she just said, I don't want to do it anymore. We were very sad, you know, because we had become a family. And we all truly liked each other. And we had fun together. And she was the reason for it. In 1972, 39-year-old Elizabeth Montgomery pondered her next career move, while William Asher went on to direct more film and television. But after eight years of working side by side on Bewitched, the new dynamics strained their relationship, and Elizabeth went to Europe for a much needed respite. The whole thing was my fault. I was going to work every morning, and she was doing nothing. And uh, it, it, it got to her, and um, she finally just took off. I was angry that she had left, so I left. In 1974, Elizabeth and William Asher decided to end their 11-year marriage. Because her parents' breakup had been so personally wrenching, Elizabeth tried to make her own divorce as painless and private as possible for her family. She would never let people intrude, press, photographers. They all wanted some glimpse of her personal life, and as she said, it's called personal for a reason, no. Ready to return to work and eager to put Samantha behind her, Elizabeth accepted a role in a gripping television drama. Entitled A Case of Rape, the story concerned a woman who was viciously attacked twice by the same man. It was difficult for a lot of fans to watch Samantha get raped. You know, to, to see Samantha get beat. Um, but it was important for Elizabeth to distance herself from Samantha. Anybody examine her the clothes? film broke new ground by depicting the ordeal of a middle-class housewife who tries to bring a rapist to justice. All right, let's see your bruises. The two-hour drama became one of the highest-rated TV movies of all time. That's a nice one. Elizabeth's riveting performance garnered her a seventh Emmy nomination and the satisfaction of knowing that she had increased public awareness of an important issue. Okay, you can put your clothes back on now. That same year, Elizabeth returned to lighter fare in Mrs. Sundance, a TV western about the widow of the Sundance kid, co-starring Robert Foxworth. She walked in the room and I was dazzled immediately. I, she absolutely stole my heart from the moment I looked at her. During filming, romance blossomed between Elizabeth and the 32-year-old actor. I have ridden up trail from you and down trail all day long, nothing helps wash no no wash no dinner first of all i thought she was one of the funniest people i had ever met and completely gracious and giving and kind everything and uh easygoing and unaffected and unpretentious oh, that'll do nicely mr maddox and uh, as we hung out together and played together and had dinner together, I, I was more and more seduced and bewitched, if you will, by this wonderful woman. After three divorces, Elizabeth was not eager to get married again, but she and Robert built a life together in her Beverly Hills home. They became dear friends and lovers, and, you know, it was hard to separate them after that. These two people who were very strong, very heady, and they argued, and they had a wonderful time getting together again and making love and being happy and giggling. Now content in her personal life, Elizabeth took on a role that would forever challenge her past image as a good-natured witch. In 1975, she portrayed the infamous axe murderess in The Legend of Lizzie Borden, turning in another powerful performance. I never could abide small, dark places, even as a child. Emma knows that. She wanted me to have the big bedroom. 
didn't you, Em? Oh, we know all about you and your way, Princess Lizzie. We know how you twist arms and throw tantrums just to get your way. If I were not a lady, I should twist your arm, Mrs. Borden, right out of its side. I will have no more of this. I don't think anything thrilled her more than the idea that she had pulled off what no one thought she could do. And then to f have people begin to really respond to her and respect her as, a, as a, an accomplished actress was probably one of her great uh, victories in life. With a growing reputation as a dramatic actress, 42-year-old Elizabeth had truly come into her own. But unfortunately, the man who had launched her career more than two decades earlier was not there to share his daughter's triumph. Over the years, Elizabeth's relationship with her father had become increasingly strained. They did not get along very well at all. I never understood it. I think to some extent he was jealous of her. They had a lot of different views politically. Uh, my grandfather was right wing Republican. My mom was a little more liberal and they just didn't see eye to eye. Though Elizabeth and her father rarely spoke to each other, she was deeply saddened when in 1981, Robert Montgomery passed away at the age of 77. As America entered the conservative Reagan era, Elizabeth felt compelled to act on her own political and social conscience. She did a surprising amount of work for different causes, mostly fairly anonymously. She didn't like going where all the cameras were and it was the glitzy occasions. In 1991, Elizabeth's bewitched co-star Dick Sargent publicly acknowledged his homosexuality and he asked her to join him as Grand Marshal of the Los Angeles Gay Pride Parade. Elizabeth gladly accepted. Elizabeth, what are you here today for? Hi, buddy. Your buddy. Yeah. And now, our Grand Marshals. This year, they are Elizabeth Montgomery and her very close friend and co-worker, Dick Sargent. Since the success of Lizzie Borden, Elizabeth Montgomery had appeared in more than a dozen television movies. Still beautiful and full of vitality at 59, she continued to be a sought-after leading lady. But Elizabeth Montgomery's life was about to take yet another surprising turn. In 1993, Robert Foxworth and Elizabeth Montgomery celebrated their 19th anniversary together, but not as husband and wife. I had asked her to marry me about seven times, and she always said no. But one day, we were sitting at the kitchen table, talking, and uh, I said, you know, this situation would be so much easier if we were married. And she looked at me and she said, is that a proposal? And I said, OK. And she said, yes. <laughs> On January 28th, 1993, the couple was secretly married at the home of Barry Cross. It's typical of Lizzie. It was about her and Bob at that moment. It needn't be a publicity stunt. About 15 minutes after the ceremony, they called and said, we're married. She said, I'm married. It was, again, so childish and sweet. Publicity shy since her teens, Elizabeth gradually began to let down her guard with the press, consenting to several interviews and even launching a business with her oldest son, Billy. Elizabeth Montgomery's secret sauce. My mom was a great cook, and she made two sauces that were delicious. See, I'm like licking my lips now just thinking about it. And I thought, gosh, mom, we should market these sauces. It would be so much fun to do it together. People loved it. It was a fun thing we did together. In 1994, Elizabeth portrayed real-life Miami crime reporter Edna Buchanan in the TV movie The Corpse Had a Familiar Face. The two-hour teledrama was so popular that in 1995, CBS brought Montgomery back for a second Edna Buchanan movie, 
deadline for murder. I am, I'm, I'm gonna kill Johnny Scarfa. What do I know about him? Well, I know he carries a gun. So I would be a fool to take the time to kill two people before I shot him. I'd whack him first. Well, in the reenactment photo, he does get whacked first. But the fact that Scarfa had the time to get off three shots clearly supports my theory that Orlando was the intended victim. Is that logical or am I crazy? No, well, that's, that's logical and you're crazy. Oh, well. Yeah, nice crazy. But while shooting on location in San Diego, Elizabeth became mysteriously ill. Suffering from what seemed like a hard to shake flu, True to her fashion, she continued to work through the discomfort and obvious symptoms of a serious illness. When she finished filming, Elizabeth checked into Cedar sinai Medical Center, and doctors delivered the devastating news. She was diagnosed with inoperable cancer, and after several grueling weeks in the hospital, she decided to go home. It was just a very scary time for everyone, but she was always kind of had this great sense of humor she knew how serious it was but she didn't but she tried to be positive about about the entire situation we were all there together and so at least she went in a place where she felt loved and was at home where she felt most comfortable on May 18, 1995, Elizabeth Montgomery died of cancer. She was 62 years old. Though born into a world of wealth and privilege, she struggled to surpass her father's fame. In the process, Elizabeth Montgomery fulfilled her own ambitions and went beyond her dreams to become an icon of American pop culture. You know, the thing that, that I remember with the most affection about her is her wit. That's how I'm always gonna, gonna think of her. She was my best friend, and she was the most generous person I ever knew. I miss her voice, really. She had a beautiful voice. Oh, I'll try. I promise I'll try. Her greatest legacy is her ability to give young girls growing up an idea of how strong a woman can be. She was so natural and unaffected and unpretentious. She lived in a lot of people's homes and in their hearts.